Great, so we're going to get on to our second uh, session on Jonah. So Adrian opened uh, it up for us uh, so amazingly last week. Did such a brilliant job in, uh, in putting the whole picture of, uh, of Jonah and where he came from and uh, God speaking to him and then him running away. And today uh, we're going to look at the perfect storm. So um, Adrian complained that I'd only given him three verses uh, last week, and I only have two verses this week. So uh, there you go. I was more generous to him. <laughs> Next week, James got lots of verses, so he's, he's got even more. Um, but these two verses are great verses. As you'll remember, uh, Adrian laying out uh, that Jonah, God called him to go in this direction, uh, and he showed that great map, and then actually he ran in totally the opposite direction, heading off in completely uh, the opposite way to where God wanted him to be. So having done that, he headed down to Joppa, and he heads out on a ship to Tarshish, and then we get to verse 4. The ESV version will be up on the screen. It says, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty temp mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and had lain down and was fast asleep. So these two verses uh, pose two main points that I want us to consider, being that God sends a storm and then a response to the storm. Before I get into the details of that, I, I feel like there are two overarching um, ideas that we're seeing in this first part of Jonah that I want us to consider. The first one I've entitled The Slippery Slope of Disobedience. The Slippery Slope of Disobedience. And although we don't know the process of how Jonah got from his home in Gath Hefer to Joppa and then onto a ship in Tarshish, but going, going that way. But we know for sure that he would have had to again and again really deal with his decision that he's going the opposite way to God. I'm sure that as the word came to him, uh, as God spoke to him as he was uh, in his hometown, and he then started to think, this is something I can't do. I can't do this. I'm going to go in the other direction. Maybe, maybe even some friends and family agreed as he looked to them for wise counsel. Maybe his parents, I don't know if they were alive or not, uh, but they would have said, oy vey, if I could do a Jewish accent, and they would have said, why would a nice Jewish lad be going to Nineveh of all places? That's not for a nice a uh, place for a nice Jewish boy to go. Surely that can't be God's, that can't be the way to go. Uh, maybe people, uh, you know, helped him decide that, no, this wasn't really the right way to go. And then he would have decided, well, I think I'm going to head down to Joppa and started to uh, travel down to Joppa. When he got to Joppa, got to the sea, well, suddenly he had uh, money for enough uh, for a passage, and there are ships going to Tarshish. And again, he would have had to decide, well, actually, yeah, I'm going to get on the ship, which is going in totally the wrong direction. So again and again, he would have made this decision, if you like, trying to move further and further away from God. And our disobedience generally can follow that kind of slow, small step approach. We take one step away from God, and then, you know, we justify it. And we've got a good reason why we've taken that step away from God. And we justify it to ourselves. Maybe we justify it to others. And we find some agreement, maybe, even from others around us. And it feels okay. And maybe it even feels, you know, kind of pleasurable and feels, feels good. And there's no lightning bolt from God. So we kind of take another step. And, and then do the same thing. And we take another step, and slowly we go down the slope of disobedience. And we can do it in so many different areas of our life. We see with Jonah that as he took that step, all of a sudden, as he's on this voyage, he's suddenly faced with a massive storm. And so this process certainly didn't work out very well 
for Jonah because he was going to almost die uh, or would have died in the storm. So it wasn't a good process for him, and I wonder how is that process working out for you? As you slowly step in a direction, maybe that God that you know is not the direction that God wants you to be going into. It can be around all sorts of things. It can be around finding a partner, finding a husband or wife, and we've been, you've been waiting and waiting, and you want God to send you uh, a believer. You want this person, and you're praying, and nothing's happened, and nothing's happened. And so you take a step away from God, and you say, well, actually, I've met this other guy or girl at work who's not a believer, but but they're really nice. They're really nice. You take a step there, and then you, you go out you know, on a date, and you take another step. And, and there's no lightning bolts, maybe, but you keep taking a step. You keep taking a step actually away from God. Maybe it's in the area of finance, and um, you've been giving to God, been giving to God, uh, and maybe you've given sacrificially to God, and you feel, well, actually, we, we're struggling still financially, and, and God, you know, when are things going to change? And so you think, well, actually, next time, we're not going to give quite as much. We just, we're just going to hold a bit back, and so we take a step away from God, and, and oh, we can buy more stuff now because, because suddenly we've got more money, and so we take another step away. And there's so many areas that we can do that. We can take the slow step, go on the slippery slope of disobedience. And I think that is the way Jonah started his journey, slowly heading off in the wrong direction. The second thing I want us to consider as an overarching um, thing for our story is that God is our constant environment. God is our constant environment. Jonah has this ludicrous idea that he can run away from God, that he can hide from God in the bottom of a ship, you know, getting away uh, from his hometown, getting away from the nation of Israel. Maybe he can get away from God and escape from Him. But the reality is that in his disobedience, God is there. In the storm that we're going to look at that, that almost brings death, God is there. In, as we see later in the, in the story, his, his uh, submitting his will back to God's obedience and doing the right thing, God is there. Jeremiah 23, 23 to 24 says, Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? Those are questions that we need to answer and we need to understand that, that God is our constant environment. In our very best moments, God is there. In our very worst moments, God is there. You know, God is with you uh, today as you worship and glorify Him. He is there. God is with you as maybe you struggle with sin tomorrow, as maybe you sit on your computer and you think, I'm just going to actually look at some porn sites. No one knows. No one knows. I'm hidden away. It's hidden away. And we, you delete your history because no one's ever going to find out. Well, God is our constant environment. He knows our whole history. He knows our whole history. And He is there all the time. He is with us in our best and in our worst. He's there with Jonah as he's disobedient. He's there with Jonah as he is obedient. And the whole time, as we're going to see, he's there wanting to pour out love, pour out love, pour out love. So he is our constant environment. So let's get into these two verses a bit more. Firstly, let's look at the storm. Some points about the storm that we should notice. The first thing is that God sent the storm. In verse 4, it says, The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea and such a violent storm. God hurled it. We're talking about God who is all-powerful, the God of the universe, the God who created us and absolutely everything that we know and understand, uh, every uh, molecule God has created. So when it says God hurled a great wind, we know that it wasn't just a little 
a puff of wind. It was a great wind. This is God, the God of the universe, breaking in. It's interesting that this word hurl is used. It's used three times, actually, in this chapter. Here in verse 4, saying that the Lord hurled the great wind. In verse 5, it says, the sailors hurled the cargo off the ship in desperation. They hurled it. And then in verse 15, it says, Jonah was hurled into the sea as he submitted himself again to God's purposes. Each one of these hurls really has uh, an emphasis of God's redemptive purpose. In each situation, there's God's redemptive purpose at work. In this, wor in this word, which can sound scary, God hurling, things being hurled, there is God's redemptive purpose in each one. So the storm is sent by God. Secondly, there's nothing in these verses that says that God was angry. There's nothing that says God was angry. It wasn't that God got in a hissy fit because Jonah wasn't doing what he was told, and so he stormed up the sea and got really cross. There's nothing, nothing that gives that impression. There's nothing that says that. We see, and as we're going to see, that this is an act of God's love, an act of Him showing His compassion and mercy. That is the God whom we serve, a God of love. The Bible says God is love. That is His nature. That's the very person who He is. He is love. He is love. And the whole context of the story is in God's amazing love. So He wasn't angry, but He was taking action. Number three, in the Old Testament, we often see God speaking through storms. So we can look in Job and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, um, Zechariah. In all those, um, we see God speaking through storms. So Jonah would have been familiar with the sense of a storm coming and God dealing with him in the storm. Fourthly, the storm also represents Jonah's inner chaos and turmoil. So this storm that comes and is a massive storm on the sea, but actually it also represents what is going on inside him. As you know, when we, we step away from God, when we go in the wrong direction, there's an inner turmoil within us. You know, it stirs us up. We, we know, we just, we know we are doing the wrong thing. We are going the wrong way. And you can imagine Jonah's turmoil, a prophet of God used by God to speak uh, to the nation of Israel and now going in the wrong direction. Yes, as Adrian showed us last week, maybe valid reasons Nineveh is a terrible, scary place. The whole thing of speaking to a nation outside of Israel, lots of justification, but he would have had a turmoil inside because God had clearly said, and he was going in the other direction. And we feel that as well when we go in the way of disobedience. What does happen, though, as we go on that slippery slope, as I mentioned, is that we start to dull our consciences, and we dull and dull them down and dull them down, and eventually maybe we don't feel quite as bad, but we still really cannot get away from the turmoil inside. So those are things we need to note about the storm, and storms in our lives are never pleasant. Um, you know, we face all sorts of storms. They can strike at any time. Uh, life can be full of trouble, full of difficult things going on. And some of them are big storms, maybe things like long-term illness. Uh, we can have big storms in our life like that. We can have small daily troubles like dealing with naughty children and the exasperation that that can bring. There can be a whole range of troubles and storms that we can face in our lives. And storms can come from different places, uh, and if we look at it simply, this can be a, um, a complicated thing to look at, but simply we can look at three uh, ways that storms can come. We can say they can come from the world. So God uh, set the world on its course, created the world. Um, Adam and Eve sinned. There was the fall. Our, the creation is now subject to that fall, and it runs its course, really. And because of the fall, uh, the world is full of both 
creation decaying and also sinful man. And so we face storms because of that, because of the fallen state of nature, because of man's general selfishness and ungodly behavior and the consequences that result. And many of the storms that we face daily come from that uh, as a consequence of the fall, as a consequence of our original disobedience uh, to God. Secondly, we can face storms because of Satan and his demons, and he can uh, have influence on our lives, and God has given him temporary influence, temporary power. It's wonderful to know that it is temporary, that God has given it for a season and allowed him for this season until Jesus returns to have some influence. And so we can face storms as a result of Satan and his demons. And then we can also face storms as we see Jonah here because our God of love is shaping our lives and sends something to arrest us and take hold of us. Because of his love for us, he can and wants to work and shape us as we're going to look at a bit further on. And all of these uh, no matter where storms come from, they all call really the same response. And that response should be to turn to God. Our response in any kind of storm has got to be to turn to God. He wants us to turn from Him, not to keep running, not to keep moving away, but to turn to Him. And as we turn to Him, He gives us understanding of what we need to do next. Maybe we need to rebuke the enemy and deal uh, with what the enemy is doing. Maybe we need to endure uh, for a season. Uh, maybe He has things to work out uh, in our lives. Um, but we only understand those things as we turn to God. So our first and most important thing is to turn to God. I want to think a, a bit more, take us a bit further as we think of in this situation where God has sent the storm to Jonah. Jonah running away, now this massive storm comes. Well, what is the worst possible thing that God can do to us? I don't know if you've ever thought about that. What is the worst possible thing that God could ever do to us? The worst thing. Well, the worst thing that He can do is withdraw from us. The worst thing that He can do is withdraw from us and leave us to our own devices. We know that if God withdrew His hand from the world, well, actually it would cease to exist. But even if it still existed, we know it would turn into chaos and anarchy. If God withdraws, it is the worst thing that can happen. If you think of it more personally, though, how extremely damaging would it be to us if our Heavenly Father neglected and didn't care for us, if He withdrew from us? We know the damage done when earthly fathers pull away and withdraw from their children, when they are absent for some reason, when they neglect uh, fathering their children. And you may have known that yourself. You may have known the neglect of a father or a father that was absent and the damage that that does in our lives. So how much more is the damage going to be if our Heavenly Father withdrew from us? So the very worst thing that God could have done to Jonah was to let him sail off on his Mediterranean cruise. If he didn't let him sail off around the meds, having a great time, it's beautiful weather, it's lovely around the Mediterranean, off to Spain, to Tarshish, never visited there, would love to go there. It would have been the worst thing that God could have done, was actually let him off and say, I'm not going to bother with him anymore. But wonderfully, though, and amazingly, though, God steps in. He steps in and He saves Jonah from a meaningless life. He saves him from wasting his life trying to outrun God, and that is His grace. That is His grace. This storm is God's grace to Jonah. It is God's incredible, incredible grace. As we were singing before, the scandal of grace, that means that God doesn't leave us to the fate we deserve, but He rescues us. He rescues us. He interrupts our lives to restore us to Himself. 
It's absolutely amazing. This is the scandal of grace that He doesn't let us head off on the path that we've chosen, but He breaks in and He interrupts. And Jonah has a storm. Why? Because God cares for him, because He loves him. And so He breaks in with a violent storm. That's scary, and, and He doesn't know what's going to happen. But it brings him back to God. And if he died there, having come back to God, well, that would have been great, actually, because he would have been back to God. But God had more, obviously, for him to do. This is the incredible scandal of grace. <clears throat> Recently, I have visited a, a guy in jail um, here in Sydney. I've uh, seen him a couple of times. And he had become a Christian as a child. Uh, and he'd been badly abused him uh, and other stepchildren had been abused by his father. And then as a 20-year-old, he had turned away from God. And really, ever since, I think he's now in his uh, 40s, he's been on the run. He's been on the run from God. And he's actually been all around the world, done jobs all around the world. And now he's ended up here in Sydney. Uh, he was born in the UK, but here ended up in Sydney and ended up in prison in Sydney. And in prison, he has turned back to God. And his statement to me was, I've run from God for over 20 years, and I can't do it anymore. I've been so stupid, I can't describe how amazing it is to know him again. And as I prayed with this guy, it was just so amazing to, to see that in him. And just to see that even though he was in this terrible situation, and it's, it's partly his own fault, but he's in prison, and he, he, he knows uh, he's made a mess, but the thing that has really struck him so much is how he's just wasted running away from God for over 20 years. And even though he'd had a terrible childhood, abused by his father, you could say, well, he had every excuse, you know, to turn away from God, really. But what does he see now? I've wasted, I've wasted these years. I've wasted. But God has broken in. He's in prison. That's terrible. He's in prison. But it's a storm, but God has broken in. Now, I'm... You know, why he's in, in prison doesn't matter, but God has broken in. He's used that situation, and he's turned his life around. He's got to face the consequences of uh, where he is, but his life is changed. So God's grace, as he breaks through in our lives, is an amazing, amazing thing. In verse 4, uh, as I've said, there's the Lord hurled a great wind. And this word wind is the Hebrew word ruach, which um, those who've been Christians for some time would probably know that word. It's a word that uh, we use to describe the wind being the Holy Spirit, the ruach of God, the Holy Spirit. And we see this word uh, used in the Old Testament when the Holy Spirit is at work. In Genesis 1-2, it says the Spirit, or Ruach, of God was moving over the face of the waters. As, as the world was created, the Ruach of God was there. In Ezekiel, in the Valley of Dry Bones, we see these bones are brought back to life by God, and it says, I will make my Spirit, or Ruach, enter you, and you will come to life. In these cases and other cases where the word's used, they all to do with bringing order out of chaos or life out of death. So in creation, out of chaos and nothingness, God brought order, brought creation. The Ruach of God brought that. In Ezekiel, the dry bones, dead bones, lifeless, God, the Ruach of God brings life. And this winds, this Ruach of God that we see in this story, bringing the storm, the Ruach coming on the waters to bring the storm, Actually, what it was going to do was bring life. So while the storm that Jonah was facing was violent and scary, but actually God is going to bring order and life out of it. And life actually not only for Jonah, uh, not actually only for him, but for those that are around him, the sailors that get caught up with God's man. And you, we're going to see that later in the story. But they are equally affected. 
So as God's grace interrupts our lives, we see change. We see change. Change on the inside. As Jonah responds to this outer storm of God, he will find the inner storm becoming peaceful as he submits to God's training and to His will. What is so encouraging in this story is that God is so interested in Jonah. He is so much more interested in us than what we achieve. You know, He he is interested in you for who you are. Yes, He's got things He wants you to do, but He's interested in you because of who you are not because of what you have achieved. Because the reality is, if Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, well, God could have sent any number of prophets to Nineveh. He could have sent a donkey to Nineveh and and got them to repent. He could have sent anything, absolutely anything. But the amazing, wonderful thing about the story is that he doesn't. He loves Jonah for who he is. He's committed to him, to shaping him, to bringing him through. And so he, if you like, pursues Jonah. Jonah moving away from God, trying to move away from God. But he pursues him, and there's a storm, and he breaks in and interrupts his life because he loves him, because he wants to shape his life, because he wants to bring him into his amazing purposes. God is wonderful that he loves us that way. He loves you that way. Yes, as I said, he's got things for you to achieve, but he doesn't love you because you brought a word this morning. He doesn't love you because you prayed uh, every morning this week. He doesn't love you because you've memorized huge chapters of the Bible. Yes, those things are brilliant, but He loves you because of who you are, and He pursues you for who you are. He wants to shape your life, and He wants you to know His love poured out again and again and again and again. You need to know that in your heart this morning. He doesn't want you. He hasn't chosen you just for what you're going to do, but for who you are, for who you are. So we've looked at the storm. Let's have a look at the response and then consider how do we respond to storms in life. Well, firstly, we see the sailor's response. The sailors' response is they are petrified, obviously, of this massive storm because the ship's going to start to break apart. And so they cry out to their own gods. Uh, Nothing happens. The storm continues, so they start to hurl their cargo, their livelihoods, into the sea. And the amazing thing about God rescuing us, God's grace breaking in, is that it's not only that we don't deserve it, we don't not only not deserve to be rescued, but actually we often don't even know we need to be rescued when He rescues us. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning, if you haven't been rescued by Him, then there's a good chance that actually you don't even know you need to be rescued. You don't even know that. You know, these men were drowning, and maybe you don't even know that you are drowning and you need rescuing. You don't even know that. And we live in a culture that thinks she'll be all right, mate. And actually, she won't. (laughs) She won't be all right at all, because we're drowning. We are. We're drowning. And then, like these sailors, suddenly they hit a storm, they hit trouble, Well, then they start to call on their gods, and maybe you have gods that you call on. Maybe it's wealth. Maybe you think, well, I'm financially secure, so yeah, I run into trouble. Um, God, what's God? I don't need God because I'm financially secure. And then there's a GFC, and the storm comes, and what do you trust? What do you trust? Maybe it's your family, and you think, yeah, well, my family is wonderful, and suddenly sickness hits and there's a storm. What do you trust? What do you trust? What we find is when we don't know God, if you don't know God this morning, you hit storms, we find that these other gods, these other things we put our trust in, they're not enough. They're not enough. They don't help us through. And at the end, we left with just not understanding what is going on, and, and we cannot 
uh, be satisfied by these other gods that we have in place. And as believers even, we need to be aware of this, that, that people around us are maybe not even aware that they need to be rescued. You know, we can run out into the street shouting, don't go this way, don't go this way, this road goes nowhere, it leads to death, don't go this way, don't go this way. And, and they look at us and think, are you mad? Look, it's a big wide road. There are big wide gates for me to walk through. There's a big wide road here. Look at all these people are walking down this road. It talks about that in Matthew. Jesus uses it and says there's this big wide road which leads to death, actually. But people don't understand. People don't understand. We need to be praying. We need to be praying for believers that God will open their eyes to see where they are heading. Prayer is so important for us, so important that we are praying for those around us that don't even know they need to be rescued. They don't even know. And we, we can bring the Word of God to them, and sometimes they, they just laugh that off because they don't even know that this is, this is the rescue rope. This is the lifeboat coming to get them. We need to pray that God will open their eyes, open their eyes to see that they need a rescuer, and Jesus is the only one that can rescue them. So if you're here this morning and you don't know that, we're going to pray for you that God would open your eyes to see the rescue that you need. So whether we're a Christian or not, these storms that come, we have a choice. I think day in, day out, really, we have a choice with how we respond to God. We need to decide how we live day in, day out. Do we respond to what God is doing in our life, whether it's a storm or whether it's a sunny day? Do we respond to what God is doing in our life? Or do we go off in our own selfish motives? In Jeremiah, uh, it uses the picture of heat being on us. And heat uh, coming on us uh, is, is what we face each day. Each day we face heat. We face um, different things in our lives. Maybe good things, maybe bad things. But we have heat uh, coming on our life, as the picture is showing us there. And then we have a choice with how we respond. One way we can respond is with thorns. So thorns are our ungodly response to the situation. We respond in an ungodly way, and that produces thorns in our lives. Because we're not responding to God, we're responding in an ungodly way. And the reality is we always respond one way or the other. We're never passive in situations. We always make a choice. We're never just really neutral. We either we're not just passive. We decide, yes, I go with God. No, I don't go with God. And Jonah here, we see him having run away, trying to run away from God. He's gone, in verse 5, says, into a deep sleep. He's gone into a deep sleep. He's trying to deal with this inner turmoil that we said he's having. And so he goes to the bottom of the ship, um, right down where he's trying to hide away. And he goes into a deep sleep to try and hide from what he is really feeling. How do you hide from God? How do you hide from God? Maybe it's watching endless TV shows. Maybe the TV is a place that you hide because it, it just takes you out of those circumstances. You don't have to think about it anymore. So you can just hide there. Maybe you have an extra glass of wine. Maybe that's how you hide. Maybe you hide by exercising again and more and more and more because that's actually going to keep you busy in a place to hide. Maybe you suddenly get busier at work and you throw yourself into your career and into your job and you throw yourself in. Like Jonah, actually, you're just asleep in the bottom of the ship in a deep sleep because you're trying to hide the inner turmoil as we make this move away from God. These things produce thorns. They produce wrong reactions in our lives. What we need to do, what our response always needs to be, is to come to the cross. Again and again, we need to come to the cross. So if I've taken that step where I'm producing thorns, or whether I'm deciding what to do, both, for both the answer is coming to the cross. We've got to come to the cross. Psalm 46 says that God is our ever-present help in trouble. He is our ever-present help in trouble. So he comes to help us, he comes to give us patience, to give us endurance, but actually much more than that, because of the cross, 
the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. The Holy Spirit lives in us and is a deposit in us. And as we turn to God and we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, the Holy Spirit comes and reminds us that you're a son, that you're a daughter, that you're loved by God, that He's shown you grace upon grace upon grace, that He's called you to be a part of His mission. That's what happens as we come to the cross, as we allow the Holy Spirit to change us from the inside out and to shape us. And having come to the cross, we then produce fruit. And we produce fruit as we respond in a godly way to the situa situation. We now have a heart that is changed by the cross, and we live in the good of that. And as heat comes, actually we produce fruit because we allow the heat to work on us if God is doing that, and we produce fruit in our lives. We produce godly responses instead of uh, de habitual sin, where again and again we go down that same path, as we keep bringing that to the, the cross, we produce, start to produce fruits. We start to produce a harvest of righteousness. So like he did with Jonah, God has entered your story. He's entered your story. He's entered your life, if you know him, and you'll never be the same again. You'll never be the same again. But the question for each of us today and every day, is how will we respond to God? How will we respond to God? Will you respond with thorns? Will you respond with a reaction that goes down the slippery slope of disobedience? Jonah, deep sleep, trying to hide. Or will you respond to God's cross and allow fruit to come in your life? We have a choice God is calling us to respond afresh to Him today. No matter what you're facing, whether you're dealing uh, with difficulties. Could the band come up? Chloe? If we could sing Scandal of Grace again, Chloe, that would be great. No matter what difficulties you're facing, you may be facing storms and you think, I've just, I can't carry on in this. You need to turn to God and look to God to give you wisdom. What do you do with that storm? What does He want to show you in the storm? Is He breaking through with fresh grace for your life through the storm? As you face dealing with sin and disobedience, well, come back to the cross. That's where grace is. Fresh grace is there for you. God's grace, His love poured out on your life again and again. Come and receive fresh grace this morning for your situation. Whatever it is you're struggling with, God has grace for you this morning. So let's stand.